You're about to hear an episode of Viv and Dave's Real Voices of Happy Valley. And in this episode, Dave talks to Kerry and Neil, who are involved, very much involved, um, with the Highhurst Wood Meadow project. Mm -hmm. And um, their enthusiasm shines out and it's a joy to listen to. It is. It's, it's Kerry McQuaid, who lives on Dodnays nearby here, uh, and Neil Diamond. Mm, not, not Neil Diamond. <laughs> no, You're not, not getting a blast of sweet Caroline halfway uh, through. Uh, although it would be lovely if uh, <laughs> on one of the uh, community gatherings that <laughs> Kerry talks about here, if people did blast out <laughs> sweet Caroline on the, on the, on the wood meadow. Um, yes, they're, they're both volunteers uh, mm. working on a project uh, to do something nice with uh, an old field that has been largely ignored and a good thing as you will hear that it is has been ignored um they're fascinating people aren't they they yes they really are yeah. yeah so into what they're doing and they've looked into the history of it and exactly what makes up this field and you're quite kind of scientific but with heart Mm-hmm. You know. And a bit of history to come as well. Uh, and that's what our podcast series is about. It's about the sort of fantastic and, uh, and uh, enthusiastic people of our lovely Calder Valley. Yeah. So, first of all, I asked Neil um, what the project is. So, let's have a listen to Neil. In one sentence, it's Hebden Lloyd's Bio- Biodiversity Hotspot, or at least it has aspirations towards that end. Hebden Royd being the local town council. Indeed, yeah, yeah. Uh, until very recently, it was grazed, just a farmer's field. Um, it's owned by Calderdale Council, but Hebden Royd took on the lease for managing it about a dozen years ago now, I think. I think because at the time there was demand for allotments, so they needed space for allotments. <coughs> so that's how the allotment started off at the top. Mm-hmm. And around the same time, there was a scheme um, to plant more trees uh, with tree responsibility. I I recently discovered that they had, that was as part of a scheme to have a community orchard there. Mm. So the Mm. new trees that they were going to plant was like a wind. wind Yes, I remember that was uh, was talked about a a while ago. Yeah. I mean, these trees out the front were done by tree responsibility, weren't they? Yeah. Were they? Yes. (laughs) So the idea was um, to plant more trees, and this was probably going back two or three years ago now. And I haven't yet got to the bottom of why, but they decided before they planted more trees, they would do a botanical survey of the field. And I think they were totally gobsmacked, to be honest, in what they found. We got, um, or the council got, uh, Steve Hindle, otherwise known as Peachy Steve, from the National Trust, who's the ancient grasslands officer, um, uh, to do a survey, and he turned up well, turned up this amazing um, richness of of old um, hay meadow plants that were still there, lying dormant either in the soil, the seeds, or just uh, not not very common at all, but definitely there, but enough there to to and and, and, and uh, enough variety, a sheer number of species to to indicate to him that this this is uh, ancient or was an ancient hay meadow and shouldn't be planted on. So there was a moratorium yes. on planting trees at that point. There's something like he said, there's something like 40 plants in the worldwide red list of endangered plants for this kind of grassland. And we've got some ridiculous number, like 28 something or something. Like we've got that, a really yeah, high yeah. number of very rare plants. plants yeah. So we're talking about, it's, you're, you're kind of talking about a wild flower meadow, but not that sort of, chocolate box one you see in the south uh, much more things that have been there forever and ever and are mm. absolutely crucial to the biodiversity yeah. of the area mm. that's fantastic it's so exciting i didn't know I, it's I, so I, exciting I, we're about 100 meters away from exactly. it and i, I didn't I, know. can i say my, my other thing which is yes. um, that um the, there used to be a f- big farm up here. Instead of all this, the estate, there was called a big High farm Hurst. called Highhurst. Mm-hmm. And the two fields that we're talking about, because the, there's a second field that, that the this the project hasn't got put into use yet, but it's got its uh, got ideas for. Um, uh, they were hay fields, so they would people would go out, presumably men, and just c- scythe the hay by hand for the farm. So it's never had uh, what do you call it mechanical um, machinery on yeah. it. 
So the soil is really pure. The whole style of doing that is really good for biodiversity and getting seeds to drop into the soil and grow again. And then the animals come in and graze and it all, it's all a fantastic system. Fantastic. So that's so that that's why it's such it's, it's so interesting because it's unspoiled. It's yeah. it looks unremarkable, but it's actually really interesting. Yes, it was just uh, thought of locally as a hillside. A with hillside. Sheep on it. It's too <laughs> too too steep to do anything very much. A yeah. thoroughfare for people going up and down a bit. Well, it wasn't even that because it was just a it was a private field. Oh, that's so, true. We couldn't so even go no through. So there's no right it. of way. No. no, not at all. No. But fast forwarding a bit, Steve mm. also did a fungi survey last year because, as Kerry said, the soil. It's probably never been ploughed or disturbed, so that's, it's had centuries probably of similar grazing and making hay, scything and, and whatnot, but not no ploughing or digging up the soil. So it's had this all this time for the fungi to develop and colonise the place. And again, we've got dozens, what these you know, tens of these red data species that you know some of them are really, really rare. Um, he saw things that he doesn't see very much no. at all. And it was just it was just there. fascinating going on this first survey we did we got the volunteers and he gave us these little metal sort of thin wire um flags with a bit of plastic and all we had to do is walk from one side of the meadow to the other and just stick a flag in whenever we saw one we couldn't really see anything when we started off but when you start to really look and this was back in the autumn amongst the grasses there are all these weird things called like earth tongues that are like little worms like little black worms and candle yeah. things and wax caps which are very um a whole whole class classification of these types of fungi which again indicate uh, you know they're associated with with meadows uh, and and it, you know uh, totally unknown before but to be fair i mean as steve was saying that it's probably they're partly so rare because people haven't really looked that much in this area no. and he's convinced that uh, you know, many of the fields in the upper Calder valley could be as rich as this it's just that this one now is sort of protected to some extent now it's come under council ownership. but it's been protected by not being used except by sheep has it the, the really <laughs> the really lovely thing is that actually human interaction has 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 What's the word? Has um, increased biodiversity by by putting animals in just in the the spring and the autumn. Correct me if I get the sounds wrong. Right, that's right. in the autumn yeah. and doing nothing, taking off the grass, but doing nothing else. It's actually increasing the biodiversity yeah. because putting in animals really adds to the whole picture. So I get excited because it's the one thing that human beings are doing. I mean, there's many in this area. Human <laughs> beings do lovely things in this area, but. One of the great things is we're actually making this land better. Humans, human activity is making something better. That's fantastic. Which is fantastic, Kerry, because, is it not? It's, well, it's a our, straightforward our, win. Our, as I said, as I said, just said earlier, our podcast is about the fantastic things that yes. people do in the area yeah. that improve yeah. yes. the area. Yeah. So that's 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 absolutely great yeah. to because hear. Because then we could get onto the fact, the fantastic group of volunteers and workers who who are getting this project up and running which again in itself is a complete delight in my opinion it is yes yeah, nikki greaves in the council nikki harvey harvey i'm so sorry <laughs> <laughs> nikki harvey in the council nikki greaves is somebody else completely and um <laughs> rachel lightbird who's the um climate emergency and biodiversity coordinator there you go so she's uh, managing is this. she employed by yes the per council. perhaps we should go back a, a little but, bit yeah <laughs> One thing I wanted to say first, on top of what Kerry's just said about <coughs> fascinating with, with what humans do, good thing. The thing that got me first interested in hay meadows is that they, they're unique in a way in that they are uh, a, 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 a sort of combination, a fi very finely tuned balance between landscape, wildlife and humans. Mm. And if you change any one of those things, i.e. The, the animals that come in or you know, the type of farming or the climate changes mm. or the human management changes, then you're going to get a different kind of uh, association of plants growing there. And when I was employed as a Haytime community officer in the North Pennines a few years ago, that's why I bring this expertise from. Yeah. Haytime. Hey community, community, yeah. oh, yeah. community officer. Community <laughs> officer. When, when I told my dad I first got the job, he said, what, you're going to go around policing all the farmers, making sure they're writing, that their hay is good enough? I said, no, dad, I'm just, I'm just there to engage local people with the, with, the, with the hay meadows there. But anyway... What a fascinating I know, job. So, yeah, it was. Sorry, I lost the train there. Yes. About, about the, thing. the balance of the, the balance things. of humans. Yeah. yeah. So yes. So if you change any of those those three factors, 
even slightly, um, you'll get a different um, uh, set of plants growing on fungi as well. For, and an example would be, would be here, a, a high hearse, for example, because the field that we've got currently, the meadow, the wood meadow, um, you've got the upper field and the lower field. And there's actually the remains of a dry stone wall halfway along. And the field going next to our meadow, which, as Kerry was saying, the one that the council will be taking on as well shortly, we hope, uh, was part of that same, um, if you like, system. And that must have been farmed differently because it was closer to, to the farm here. So, for example, it might have had more manure on it because it was closer to the... To the um, uh, to, to the farmhouse, oh, yeah. you didn't have to carry the stuff so much, and possibly it's where the stock would have, you know, been put out to graze. Whereas the one that we were siding at, at the weekend, the lower down that fronts onto Sandy Gate, is the more biodiverse one, and probably they've always made hay there. You'd think so, mm -hmm. and that's much richer. Mm. So it, mm. you know, and obviously these two pl different sort of communities of plants and fungi and everything else is is has evolved slightly differently over time. Mm. So we're lucky in a way that it survived mm. and hadn't been built on, which was the original plan why Cordadel, mm -hmm. you know, they obviously built the, the, the estate on top of the hill, but not down there. And again, as, as you said, it's probably because it was too steep. Mm. So, so you mentioned, Kerry, the, the amazing volunteers. <laughs> yes. I, interested well, in that, in the sort of... of which she is one. She won't say that, but who's, she's... Who's, who's, no, who's or how many people... Um, I've been involved I, I, in creating it. I, well, we had a hay end of hay making week tea on the land, and mm. there was I don't know twenty, thirty people. Yeah, a lot of people who are who have been scything during the week, or are neighbours and mm -hmm. come up and see what's going on and love it, or people who bring their kids and they're passing, or just a, it's a, quite a selection of very local people. Mm. And we're very lucky that there's Steve. Neil. Steve <laughs> that there's Neil as a volunteer who's hopefully paid a bit um, to coordinate it all, apart from the people mm -hmm. in the council. Yeah. So a lot has got done, and a lot of people have been encouraged mm. in quite a small period of time. So it's a it's a it's a disparate group, but we're pretty enthusiastic Absolutely. now. Absolutely, yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it, oh. and more always welcome. Yeah. Yes, we have to say that because you know. More people from the estate must come and picnic and yeah. enjoy. And, and how, how do people get involved? Well, um, they can get in touch with us at, at the town council. Um, mm -hmm. Either email the town council, info at Hebden Lloyd, something. Mm -hmm. I'll find or, that out and yeah, put okay. it at the end. Yeah, and we have a Facebook page. There's a high host. Hurst... Wood Meadow Project Facebook page, yeah. It's got nice pictures of what's, what we've been doing this yeah, week. yeah. Oh, so people people can see the photographs and yes, yes. See how it's how it's developing and get in touch with you yeah. through the Facebook page. Yes, certainly yeah. for sure. But, but I think the important thing as well, you know, as you say about involving people, is that the key to restoring the meadow um, it is really. I mean, there are, there's a fast track and a slow track, or or the different ways of doing it. But the the key to restoring it is to try to replicate the management that created it in the first place. So that's why, as Kerry mentioned, where we'll be gra we graze it in the spring with sheep. Traditionally, that would have been when the, the the ewes were having their lambs. So once you know they'd be bought, they'd be born and raised in this lovely sort of grassland, past, uh, you know, very rich in nutrients and stuff. And then as soon as the lambs were big enough, they'd be taken off and perhaps grazing on other fields or up on the moors or something, and the fields would be shut up. So everything would grow exponentially at once in a period of six to eight weeks and then and then they come in and cut the hay okay which is what we've been doing um and we re remove all the grasses so you're re you're low you're keeping the nutrient levels low which from the biodiversity point of view means that the more vigorous plants can't get a head start mm -hmm. and, and take over all the, all the more delicate flowers um and then that's where we're at and then Normally, you would let the ground recover and rest and maybe have a couple of weeks to grow again and you'd have the aftermath. I don't know what they used to call it in this part of the world, or the, or the fog. They called it the fog in North Pennant oh, as well. the regrowing. The regrowing. Cut. Yes, and so then they bring the sheep oh. down off, off the, off the mm -hmm. higher fields or pastures mm. or the moors to fatten up and then sell on to market. And haymaking time and, and scything in particular was, the you know, it was the crux of the year, the 
we got some of the anxiety, didn't we? Because mm. we were trying to get this hay dry this week because it's been so changeable, the weather. Because if you didn't get the hay in, you didn't have anything to feed your animals through the winter. So either you starved or you had to sell some of your stock. So then in the, in the future, you had, you had fewer, fewer um, stock from which to raise next year's crop. So it's absolutely crucial. And, and you know, that's, and that's part of the community. So, again, it's probably true, true here, but in Teesdale in particular, they, you know, because you're working up the dale, it's very much a case that neighbour helped neighbour. So you didn't, mm. you didn't stop and, and you know, relax like we probably all did on Sunday after being exhausted with all the scything and everything. You'd muck in and, and help your neighbour and they'd help the same with you. And then that would sort of move up the valley or, mm. or um, from farm to farm. Right. So it, it's always did involve the community. So one of the things I was keen on trying to replicate when, when you know, we started doing this, it's not just about getting a friendly farmer, in our case, to, to lend us her sheep or mobile lawnmowers, as some people call them, <laughs> or just doing the scything. But it's, it's, it's coming together. Yes. And as you said, yes. have, having the traditional hay time tea at the, at the end when neighbours and, and families and friends, and there'd probably be some singing and dancing and everything. Mm. Next year, let's have singing and dancing. Next yeah. Year. Because there, yeah. there's still a hangover from, I mean, the traditional farming was yeah. sustainable and, as you say, yeah. community yeah. Yeah. were involved yeah. in it, not just Very few a farmer employing people. Exactly. It's about community. Very few external yeah. and inputs. A lot of people who still have things like harvest festivals yeah. and yes. various other old traditional sort of festivals yeah. based on that yeah. um, but it might be nice I like the old idea Carrie of just let's just have a let's just yeah, do it let's just do it anyway and it's, not it's based also, it on what's happened in the past but yeah, uh, it's based yeah, on we, what we're doing now we have learnt, some of us have learned to scythe with beautiful scythes kindly provided by him mm. and Broad Town Council so that is amazing and it, you know, it's artificial in the sense that none of us are farmers but we all are part of this community so actually having a Having a skill like that again yeah. is a great yeah. leveller and gets us all yeah. together. Yeah. I'd like as well just to big up the town council. Uh, yeah, a lot too. of people me just too. don't, yeah. oh, it's the bloody yeah. council, they're yeah. all useless, blah, yeah. blah, they keep digging up our yeah. roads and yeah, all yeah. kinds of things. Amazing our taxes but, but, and stuff. <laughs> Yes, yes. Um, but, you know, a lot of people don't fully understand the different levels of councillors and what have you. Yeah. And, and you mentioned Nikki Harvey, oh, yeah. who I mean, seems to be a councillor who's influential Absolutely. Uh, and is actually doing some good. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this work, yeah. if you like, with, with, you know, acquiring the lease on the land and encouraging us to do this work... It, you know, it's her brainchild, as and she she's chair of the Climate Emergency and Biodiversity Committee. So there's this big climate emergency action plan, and the biodiversity, you know, trying to you know, increase the biodiversity is very much part of that. So that's why we're doing it, really. And and she and it's it's her. And we should also mention Councillor Richard Needham, who's very supportive. Mm, and the takes as great well. photographs, records everything that happens, <laughs> yes, which is lovely. Yes. Yeah. And I think the great thing about Nikki is she's learning as she goes as well. She doesn't know everything. She doesn't know how, the, well, how it's going to develop. She's one of the cybers, like yourself. Yeah, she's one of the yeah. cybers. She was, she was trying to work out how, whether to put ponds in or not, whether mm. to have water in or not. Mm. You know, she's lovely. She's, she's thinking on her feet, take, get, take, getting expert advice from people as yeah. to how to do it best. It's a joy. Yeah. That's oh, well, well done her. Yeah. And she yeah. must have presumably done the fundraising. Did, she, I mean, did she put in the bid to, where is it from? Um, I think it, lottery, is it? It, it was the previous um, Rachel's predecessor, oh, John. Well, John, when he started, he got the Heritage Lottery Fund oh. to put in both the easy access pass and the viewpoint so we could op open it up to visitors. Which I think is where I met you the other day. Yes. That's correct. Walking yes. up that path. That's right. And, and we also, were having a cup of tea. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And also... The, you did look as though you'd been working hard and earned that cup of tea, <laughs> Yeah, Gary. definitely. Absolutely. And also the interpretation boards to explain to people what's going on there. Mm. Because, I mean, we've mentioned it's a wood meadow, so we should probably say that there are sort of five main habitats there. This is mm. the wonderful thing about... You know, wood meadow is probably the richest, most diverse habitat you can get. It's certainly in Europe, so that's why it's not just a meadow. So we've got the woodland, which Tree Responsibility planted, and that's maturing nicely with lots of hazelnuts. So we've got a supply of cob nuts for planting on, which is quite rare in the Calder Valley. So Tree Responsibility's successor, Forest Tree, who are working with us as well, are very keen 
you know, to harvest that. So we've got the woodland and the and it's the edges which are particularly rich. So around the edge we've got a hedgerow on three sides of it, which was I think that was Dongria Khan's um as the coordinator of the chance juice it was her project that she took on just before she passed away, sadly. Um, and we've got the, the meadow. And the other thing was, going back to the community orchard, there was some funding. It, I think it was tree responsibility. But anyway, to, to plant nearly 80 heritage fruit trees of different descriptions, apples, pears, damsons, plums, yeah. plums and a couple of walnuts. And, and the lovely Mark Simmons planted that, who's that's our local... Right orchard expert yes yes in lockdown and that's very much the case that the hope is that as they mature people from the local community at Dodnays and down down in sandy gate and birchcliff will come up and help themselves pick the fruit. fruit as well mm. yeah so we're going to get some incredible edible yes yeah, absolutely very doorstep. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. can i just say i'm glad you mentioned dongria khan and there's yeah, a there's yeah. a plaque that's right i, I, I saw one out there as well dongria yeah. khan some people would know as uh, penny eastwood yeah uh, who probably as the residents of this valley who's done more uh to help with sustainability issues yeah. and any of those just stop oil you know sort of climate tra- change of protesters and dissenters mm. she is she was um well she still is an inspiration <laughs> yes, certainly. Uh, to certainly all, is. all all of those people yeah. certainly and, yeah um, quarter of a million trees she, yes. she oversaw the planting of fantastic person who is really? sort of very yeah, well yeah, missed yeah, yeah. very much missed very in much area. missed yeah. absolutely okay well thank you both oh, my pleasure. thank you for all yes. that and, Thanks uh, for recording it for posterity or that's, whatever. That's, that's, that's what it's for. Well. Okay. But, yeah, but I mean, as, as you said, you know, we're always looking for more volunteers to help. I mean, one of the on Rachel's ever lengthening job list um, is to start up a friends group with the idea we can coordinate work that's needed and doing in the, in the meadow, not just at siding time. So if anyone's interested in volunteering, um, uh, then to get in touch and, and we'll add them to the list and hopefully we'll get, we'll get things going uh, in the autumn. And, and it is fun getting involved in community projects, oh, isn't it's it? fantastic. The, it's the, really the joy fun. on your face, yeah. both when I saw you out there in the, in the meadow and just now talking about it. Yeah, it's, no, it's yeah. unbeatable. Um, to be, you know, I can get there in 200 yards, mm-hmm. two seconds... Yeah. Meeting new people, being outdoors, doing something positive. What 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 could yeah. be better? And she brings us the best ice cream. Homemade ice cream. Homemade ice cream. That too. Okay, I only live a few doors up the road. Yeah. I didn't know about that. <laughs> You'll see me more often now. <laughs> Arrangements could be made. <laughs> yeah. yes. Okay, yeah. thanks a lot. Thanks. You can contact the Wood Meadow people at info at Hebdenroyd Town Council or one word. Dot gov dot uk. And uh, there was mention of Dongria. I could just stress it was Dongria Cond, not Khan, and she was instrumental in uh, environmental activism and um, founded Tree Responsibility. And if there's an option to subscribe or follow on your podcast platform, please do so. And you can find us on Facebook, Real Voices of Happy Valley. Uh, recommend us to your friends. Thanks very much.